This is Myron C. Fagan. During the past 20 years of my more than 60 years of experience on Broadway and in Hollywood, as a playwright, director, and producer, I have received many thousands of letters from fans and worshipers of the movie stars who have been identified by congressional committees and the FBI as collaborators in the Red Conspiracy to destroy our country, asking me why and how their idols have become Reds, and pleading with me to assure them that it is not true. Unfortunately and regretfully, I cannot give them that assurance. I say regretfully because the vast majority of those Red Stars have been my close friends through all the years that I have been on Broadway and in Hollywood. But in this recording, I will endeavor to show how and why they joined in the Red Conspiracy. The most thrilling and most glamorous phase of life in our country always has been the world of entertainment. At the turn of the century, that world of entertainment was primarily the living theater, Broadway. In 1907, I became a part of that world as a playwright, director, and producer. Then some years later came the movies, and a new glamour world came into existence. It was called Hollywood. But until 1930, Broadway was my world. Then as the movies were transformed into what they then called the talkies, I came to Hollywood. As a result, I came to know both worlds well. During all the years from 1907, practically every known star, from Mrs. Leslie Carter, Douglas Fairbanks, Helen Morgan, Clark Gable, and many others, appeared in one or more of my plays and films or under my direction. All of them were close friends. Then in 1945, I suddenly discovered that Hollywood, the land of glamour, had become a cesspool of treason that many of those glamorous stars, writers, directors, and producers were the backbone of a horrifying communist conspiracy and were deliberately using their very glamour and the screen to glorify communism in Moscow and to create an ugly American conception of America and the American people throughout the world. Until that year of 1945, I did not have the slightest suspicion that many of those close friends and associates were as deep in the commission of treason as Alger Hiss. Tragically for me, in my eyes, their treason was even more heinous because they were employing the unsuspecting adoration of their worshippers to poison tip the daggers they were plunging into their backs. True. During the early 1940s, I was puzzled and actually bewildered when I saw Mission to Moscow, produced by Warner Brothers, Song of Russia, produced by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, North Star, produced by Samuel Goldwyn, all of them wildly enthusiastic about the glorious way of life in liberal communist Russia. But I accepted the explanation of the producers that those films were merely gestures to our then wartime ally. But later, when I saw the doctored versions of the same films that were exhibited all over the world, versions that depicted Moscow as the world's only hope against a decadent America, and learned that the doctoring had been approved by the producers, by our State Department, and by Franklin Roosevelt, I began to smell a rat. A lot of rats. At this point, so as to leave nothing to imagination, let me tell you exactly how this treason by our most beloved people was launched. In the collective mind of all of the American people, Broadway and Hollywood has always stood for theater, entertainment. It was a world apart, peopled by pixies who until the 1920s lived and breathed nothing but grease paint and makeup box. Their world was bounded by the stage door on the one side and the footlights on the other. They were dedicated only to amusement and entertainment. Then in the early 1920s, a sinister force began to creep its way into that harmless make-believe world, to transform its pixies into evil pied pipers who were to lead the American people out of the freedoms of the American way of life into the swamp of communism. Last July, in 1967, we issued a set of recordings, 
three two-sided records, which we call the Illuminati CFR Conspiracy, in which I reveal the entire great conspiracy to transform the United States into an enslaved unit of a United Nations One World Government. In those recordings, I revealed with documentary proof that the conspirators had the United States marked down for conquest since as far back as 1917. But the conspirators knew that they could not hope for success unless they could first break down our defenses and resistive powers from within. A frontal attack, such as enslaved the Russian people, could not succeed over here. The American people would first have to be conditioned to realize the wonders of Marxism. In other words, we, the American people, would have to be deluded and mesmerized. But that job would have to be done very subtly, so as not to arouse suspicions too soon. That poison would have to be hypoed into the American bloodstream by the least suspected needle, a glamorous sugar-tipped needle. The press, while necessary, could not be that needle, because it was bound to be more or less obvious. The soapbox orator, while of value, would have to do his work without cover. But who would suspect the devil-may-care, happy-go-lucky, beloved pixie of the make-believe world? Thus, in 1920, the conspirators operating in Moscow organized what they called the Cinema Bureau of the International Union of the Revolutionary Theater. Their chief objective was to, I quote, unite the creative and technical workers of the film industry in America on an international scale to create revolutionary films in all countries, unquote. The reason for their stress on the film is because one film can be shown simultaneously in a thousand theaters and reach millions in the time a stage play would reach only thousands. But the legitimate stage and the then infant radio were to be made captive too, all at the same time. In fact, the further directive stipulated that the entire infiltration was to be started through the legitimate theater, because they, the conspirators, realized that the big names on Broadway would have necessity become the big names in the then infant Hollywood. The details of how the conspirators successfully infiltrated both Broadway and Hollywood, and how they seduced the stars, writers, directors and producers into becoming their treasonous Pied Pipers is too lengthy for inclusion in this record. I will come back to that in subsequent recordings. But to remove all doubts about the authenticity of what I will now tell you, it is highly important to show you how I had discovered that our beloved Hollywood by 1945 had become transformed into the craftiest, the most brazen, the most poisonous, the most dangerous carrier of communist propaganda of all of our mass communications media. Smallpox is not more deadly than were the Reds in Hollywood, among them some of the greatest and most beloved idols of the American people. It was early in 1945 that I made my tragic discovery. I was in New York directing a new play. During the rehearsals, I was visited by an old friend of mine, John T. Flynn, a famous journalist and author of several sensational books, among them The Roosevelt Myth, While We Slept, and The Truth About Pearl Harbor. The objective of his visit was to urge me to attend a special meeting set up for me for the following Sunday in Senator Vandenberg's office in Washington. I was puzzled. I hadn't been active in journalism or in politics for many years and I couldn't understand why I was thus summoned to Washington. John did not tell me what the meeting was all about. He preferred that I should find out for myself. He simply said it was terrifically important, that it would be the most important event in my entire life. My faith in John was supreme. So late Saturday afternoon, I went to Washington. At that meeting in Washington, I was told the entire story of what had happened at the top secret meetings in Yalta, attended by Franklin Roosevelt, Alger Hiss, and Harry Hopkins, representing our government, 
and Joe Stalin, Molotov, and Vyshinsky representing Moscow, with Chip Boland serving as interpreter. It was the horrifying story of how the American traitors deliberately delivered all the nations in the Balkans and Eastern Europe to Moscow, and how they set the plans to deliver mainland China to communist control. Furthermore, Vandenberg and the others at that meeting, which included other congressmen and top officials of Army and Navy Intelligence and the FBI, had documentary proof for their story. They had microfilms and recordings of all the meetings, secretly made by Stalin, to be used as a club over Roosevelt's head should Roosevelt ever try to renege on his part of the betrayals. The underground in Russia had managed to get copies of both the microfilms and the recordings. They sent two sets of both to the United States, one set to one of our intelligence agencies, another set to Senator Vandenberg. I was stunned and horrified by what I heard and saw, but that wasn't the I learned how utterly and completely all our mass communications media were controlled by the masterminds of the great conspiracy to destroy our country. These masterminds of the great conspiracy are known as the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR, as the Illuminati is now known in our country. Immediately after Vandenberg and the others viewed those microfilms and recordings, they had called a press conference. Virtually all newspaper correspondents in Washington and heads of the Associated Press and the UPI, amongst others, were present. After revealing the entire story to them, Vandenberg asked them to front page that entire act of treason. The answer was an emphatic no. Some of the correspondents frankly admitted they wouldn't even dare to mention that they had so much as seen the films or heard the recordings, that even a mention of it would mean their jobs and their careers. Thereupon Vandenberg called in the heads of NBC, ABC, CBS, and other broadcasting channels and asked them to reveal the story on the air. He got the same emphatic no. The radio people pointed out that the Federal Communications Commission was controlled by the Roosevelt administration and the CFR, who could and would cancel their licenses if they uttered one word about that Yalta treason plot. At that point, Vandenberg hit upon a truly brilliant idea. He remembered what a terrific impact the film Mission to Moscow had made in the whole world. He realized that the Yalta story, as revealed by the microfilms and recordings, would make an even more terrific film. Thereupon, he, accompanied by other members of Congress, flew to Hollywood. The first man they approached was Harry M. Warner, head of Warner Brothers. Vandenberg reminded Warner of his frightfully grave injustice to our country and the American people when he produced Mission to Moscow in which he had glorified Moscow and communism and horribly denigrated America and the American people. Now, Mr. Warner, said the senator, you have a wonderful opportunity to undo that wrong by making a film of the true story of the Yalta betrayals. Warner's amazing reply was, gentlemen, forget about the communists. They are very fine people. Just keep on fighting the Nazis and the fascists. Bear in mind, that was after the war, and there were no Nazis and fascists left to fight. Communism was our only menace. At this point, I wish to stress a very horrifying fact. That film, Mission to Moscow, was made from a book of that same name supposedly written by our then American ambassador to Moscow, Joseph E. Davies. Actually, it was written by two Russians in the Kremlin, and our renegade ambassador, Davies, had agreed to pose as the author and have it published under his name in the United States. And, according to Harry Warner, the Warner Brothers made that film on direct orders from the White House and from the internationalist bankers, members of the Illuminati CFR cabal, who controlled the Warner Brothers lot, 
who practically control all the lots in Hollywood. Now can you see the fiendish plot behind the making of that Mission to Moscow film? How could anybody who saw that film doubt the authenticity of the glory of Moscow and the communism and the horrible decadence of the United States and the American people as depicted in a film written and produced by so-called distinguished Americans? After the Warner turndown, Vandenberg went to Louis B. Mayer whose MGM had produced Song of Russia, which had similarly glorified Russia and communism and denigrated America. Mayer gave him, in so many words, the same answer. Vandenberg then approached other Hollywood producers who had made and were making similar communist propaganda films. But everywhere he went, he got the same answer. Thereupon, Vandenberg decided upon another method. He decided that a legitimate play could serve the same purpose. True, a play would not have the instantaneous nationwide sensation that a film would create, but it would be a good starting point. He went to New York and broached the matter to several Broadway producers. But the moment he mentioned the subject, all those producers ran like thieves in the night. Some, such as Herman Shumlin, rejected the idea of such a play because they themselves were pro-communists. Others, such as Lee Schubert, were scared to death in fear of what the powers behind the great conspiracy would do to their theaters. And that was when Vandenberg went to John T. Flynn, whom he knew as a great patriot, and asked him if he knew of any playwright who could write, direct, and produce a play that would reveal that entire Yalta treason plot. And John replied, Senator, you are asking for a miracle man, a miracle man with the guts of a lion. I know of only one such man. Now you know how and why I attended that meeting in Washington. But as Al Jolson used to say, wait, you ain't heard nothing yet. What Vandenberg wanted me to do was to write a play that would be a great evening of entertainment, but not as a fictional story, but a true life story, and to name the traitors who had participated in the treason committed in those secret meetings in Yalta. Frankly, and speaking in the vernacular, that request, which was really a demand, knocked me for a loop. I pointed out that naming such men as Roosevelt, Hopkins, Alger Hiss, who had not yet been exposed as a Moscow spy, and was then being acclaimed as the hero founder of the great United Nations to ensure peace, would lay me wide open to libel suits and, but before I could say and wreck my career, Vandenberg broke in with, that's exactly what I hope will happen. Such libel suits could not be ignored by the press. It would automatically reveal the entire great conspiracy and it would torpedo the United Nations as the proposed housing for their one-world government. I recognized the truism of Vandenberg's statement, and I knew that I would be provided with plenty of defense against libel suits, because truth cannot be considered libelous. Nevertheless, the idea of writing such a play stunned me. Having already been told how all the Hollywood moguls and Broadway producers viewed the entire matter, I realized that the moment I'd write such a play, every lot in Hollywood would be closed to me. Ditto Broadway. I was faced with the hardest decision of my entire life. In addition, aside from my willingness to place my own career on the line, there were two other people whose futures would be at stake, my wife and my son, Bruce. Therefore, I had to delay my decision until I could put the entire situation before them which I did upon my return to my home in Hollywood. I told my wife that I was quite sure that if I wrote and produced such a play, I would be blacklisted both in Hollywood and on Broadway. I pointed out that there would be no more lush salaries from the film industry, no lush royalties from my plays, that she'd have to forego all the luxuries she had become accustomed to in all the previous years of our marriage. Her simple response was, did I ever ask you for all those luxuries? Loyalty to God and country came first with her. Frankly, I fully expected that kind of reaction from her. 
She was that kind of a woman, God rest her soul. My son Bruce had been associated with my theatrical activities. He could look forward to a great career, but his response was exactly the same as his mother's. He didn't hesitate for one moment. Loyalty to God and country came first with him too, and that too I had fully expected. Thereupon I went to work on the writing of the play, which I decided I would call Red Rainbow. I completed it within a matter of weeks, and then I left for New York to arrange for a cast and for a theater. The first man I approached was Lee Schubert. At that time, the Schuberts owned and controlled most of the theaters in New York and throughout the nation. I had known Lee from the time I first came to Broadway in 1907. Through the years that followed, I had had very close business relationships with him, had booked all my plays into his theaters, and we had become close and warm friends. When I asked him to assign a theater for a new play I had just completed, his first question was, is it for Red Rainbow? I was greatly surprised, because I had not mentioned the title of the play to anybody except the Vandenberg Group. But obviously, the name of the play and its subject had been leaked by somebody. Naturally, I had to admit that the play was Red Rainbow. Lee promptly produced a sheaf of letters and telegrams, all warning him that if he permitted Red Rainbow or any anti-communist play to be staged in one of his theaters, all his theaters would be stench-bombed, and he urgently advised me to forget Red Rainbow. I was terrifically disappointed, but not deterred. I contacted other theater owners whom I knew to be loyal Americans, but all had been similarly intimidated and like Schubert. They all urged me to forget Red Rainbow, but I was still determined to go ahead. I figured I could get an off-Broadway theater on an outright rental basis, and I began the job of lining up a cast for the play. I spoke with a number of top Broadway actors, many of whom I had employed in my many other plays, but I quickly learned that all of them had been warned that their appearance in Red Rainbow would mean the end of their careers. At the same time, two prominent newspaper dramatic critics with whom I had had friendly relationships, came to see me. They told me that on orders from the top, whatever that meant, they would be forced to tear Red Rainbow to shreds in their reviews and simultaneously tear me to shreds. Both of them urged me to forget Red Rainbow because if I persisted in producing it, it would mean the end of my career. So now I knew what a frighteningly complete control the Reds had on the legitimate theater, and I knew that all doors of Broadway were closed to Red Rainbow. However, I am a very stubborn man, especially when it comes to loyalty to my country. I decided to take the play back to Hollywood. In the Hollywood colony, I had many hundreds of friends, stars and top actors, many of whom had appeared in my plays and films. I felt very confident that in Hollywood I would be able to get a theater and a good cast of actors. I had not yet learned that Actors' Equity Association, the Actors' Union, had spread word to all members to shun Red Rainbow like a case of smallpox, all of which goes to show how naive I was at that time, how little I knew of the Red Conspiracy in the entertainment world how little I knew of the overall great conspiracy to destroy the sovereignty of our nation. Because the moment I mentioned Red Rainbow in Hollywood, the very same things that happened on Broadway were duplicated in Hollywood, only more so. Every theater owner, every actor, trembled with fear at the very mention of Red Rainbow. On top of that, some of my closest friends in the industry confidentially informed me that I had been tried in absentia by the Hollywood moguls, some of whom I had considered my very good friends, and the verdict was that if I persisted in my efforts to produce Red Rainbow, I would be a dead duck on every lot in Hollywood. Realizing that I was butting my head against a stone wall, I surrendered. That is, I decided to forget about Red Rainbow for the time being but I did not give up my determination to expose the Yalta treason. 
I decided to write a new play in which I would do the very same kind of exposing. But to avert all suspicions, I gave this new play a very innocuous title. I called it Thieves' Paradise. The plot or story of this new play was all about a domestic problem of a family living in Bulgaria. It was a distinctly humorous story. Anyway, the first two acts were. To those who were familiar with my writing style, Thieves' Paradise sounded like some of my earlier comedies, such as The Little Spitfire, The Siren, Missmates, and I very carefully but innocently spread the word that it was just that kind of a play. This time I had no difficulty getting a theater, which I rented outright and engaged my own staff to operate it with my son Bruce serving as the producing manager. Likewise, this time I had no difficulty getting a cast, but I picked that cast very carefully, engaging actors and actresses whom I knew to be zealously loyal to America. Now the important point about Thieves' Paradise was that while the first two acts were distinctly comedy drama and contained no indication of the exposition of the Yalta and United Nations plottings, the third act was devoted entirely to the exposition. Therefore, I did not allow anybody, not even my scene designer, to read the manuscript in its entirety. I had a special reason for that precaution. Under the Actors' Equity Association rulings, the first week of rehearsals was to all intents and purposes, a probationary period. During that first week, any actor who found his part undesirable could serve notice on the producer and withdraw from the play. The same ruling applied to the producer, who, if he felt an actor had been miscast, could replace the actor. But after that probationary week, both the producer and the actors were bound by contract and neither could withdraw. Thus, during the first half of the probationary week, I rehearsed only the first act. During the second half of that week, I rehearsed the second act. On the eighth day, after the probationary week was over, I put the third act into rehearsal. And that was when, as the saying goes, all hell broke loose. Word got out that although Thieves' Paradise was not Red Rainbow, it was to do the very job of exposition I had intended to do with Red Rainbow. But it was too late to stop me. But the Reds did not surrender. During the following week, all the actors in the cast were harassed by anonymous phone calls, especially all through the nights, threatening them and their families with dire consequences, even assassination, unless they would pull out of the play. Naturally, I received similar warnings, but we all disregarded all threats. However, one night, a few days before the opening performance, somebody tried to run our star, Michael Whalen, off a cliff on his way home after a rehearsal. He reported that to me the next morning. It infuriated me, and I blurted out, if that's the way they want to play this game, I'll play it that way too. And I stated that on the opening night after the last curtain, I would deliver a curtain speech in which I would reveal the entire Red conspiracy in Hollywood and name 100 of the Red Star's writers and directors who were the backbone of the conspiracy. That statement was brought to the attention of Jimmy Fiddler, then the most prominent radio commentator in Hollywood. Jimmy phoned me and asked me if I really would deliver such a curtain speech. I asked him why he wanted to know. He replied, if you will really do it, I will devote my entire Sunday night broadcast to it. Thereupon I assured him that I would. Then he said he understood that I would name 100 top stars, writers, and directors as Reds. I told him that was correct. Jimmy was amazed. He didn't know there were that many Reds in Hollywood. He said, do you realize that under California law you could be subjected to criminal libel suits? I said, I knew it. He then said, are any of the people you will name really important stars? I said, well, I don't know if you consider them important, but among those I will name are Eddie Cantor, Edward G. Robinson, Catherine Hepburn, Gene Kelly, Gregory Peck. Wow, exclaimed Jimmy. Do you have any documentary proof that they are Reds? 
I assured him I had plenty. At this point, I will digress for a moment to clarify that documentary proof matter. At that meeting in Washington, I was informed by FBI agents and members of the House Committee on Un-American Activities that it was commonly known that there was a widespread communist conspiracy in the world of entertainment, particularly in Hollywood, but they could not institute an investigation until they could get documentary proof to warrant a congressional hearing. And even the FBI admitted that they had been unable to break through the Iron Curtain around Hollywood. Such proof could be obtained only by someone inside the industry. Well, of course, I was very much inside in Hollywood. So during the weeks that I was working on my plays, I quietly began to gather such proof as photostatic copies of membership cards in the Communist Party and other communist activities. And to give credit where it is due, I got a lot of help from Adolf Manju, Clark Gable, Rupert Hughes, and other loyal Americans in the Hollywood colony. So that by the time I was talking with Jimmy Fiddler, I had acquired documentary proof of red activities by more than 300 Hollywood celebrities. Among them, Dalton Trumbo, John Howard Lawson, John Houston, Gershwin, etc. All of which I naturally turned over to Senator Jack B. Tenney, then chairman of the California State Senate Fact-Finding Committee, Parnell Thomas, chairman of the Congressional Committee, and the FBI. Now let's go back to that opening night curtain speech. True to his promise, on the Sunday night before the opening performance of Thieves' Paradise, Jimmy Fiddler did devote his broadcast to the subject. It came in the form of a warning to the Los Angeles Police Department, the Sheriff's Office, and the American Legion to guard the El Patio Theater on the following night as Pearl Harbor should have been guarded because he had had information that the Reds would prevent the play from going on even if they would have to bomb the theater out of existence. That broadcast created a terrific sensation. Hours before the curtain was to go up, Hollywood Boulevard in the vicinity of the theater was so crowded that the police had to divert all traffic. And the American Legion responded to Fiddler's warning. In the patio of the theater, there were 16 stands of colors, each one guarded by four legionnaires in full uniform, armed with rifles, ready for any trouble. In accordance with my promise, immediately after the final curtain was dropped, I delivered my curtain speech in which I clearly revealed the entire Red Conspiracy and named 100 of the top stars, writers, directors, and producers who composed the backbone of that conspiracy. Now bear in mind, until that night, more than 99% of the American people had not had the slightest knowledge that their idols had been involved in this heinous, treasonous conspiracy. So you can imagine the horrifying shock that rocked that audience when I named the following great celebrities as the guilty ones. I don't have enough space to name all of them, but here are a few of them. First of all, I named Charlie Chaplin, who together with a full dozen other top stars had signed a secret radiogram to Joe Stalin pledging allegiance to the Soviet Union. I followed with Lucille Ball, whose home had for years been the headquarters for the chief Hollywood Red activists. Then I named Lauren Bacall, Humphrey Bogart, Marlon Brando, Lloyd Bridges, Eddie Cantor, Lee J. Cobb, Joseph Cotton, Betty Davis, Olivia de Havilland, Kurt Douglas, Melvin Douglas, Florence Eldridge, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Jose Ferrer, Henry Fonda, Ava Gardner, Paulette Goddard, Rita Hayworth, Van Heflin, Paul Henried, Catherine Hepburn, Lena Horne, Marsha Hunt, Chet Huntley, John Ireland, Burl Ives, George Jessel, Danny Kaye, Gene Kelly, 
Burt Lancaster, Peter Lorre, Myrna Loy, Frederick March, Groucho Marx, Burgess Meredith, Henry Morgan, Paul Muni, Gregory Peck, Vincent Price, Edward G. Robinson, Robert Ryan, Pete Seeger, Frank Sinatra, Franchot Tone, Orson Welles, Keenan Wynn, Leonard Bernstein, Harold Clurman, Stanley Kramer, Mark Connolly, Norman Corwin, Carl Foreman, Ira Gershwin, Johnny Green, Ben Hecht, John Houston, Garson Kanan, Elia Kazan, Louis Milestone, Norman Mailer, Arthur Miller, Clifford Odets, Dorothy Parker, Otto Preminger, Dory Sherry, Bud Schulberg, Howard K. Smith, Donald Ogden Stewart, Billy Wilder, and Langston Hughes, infamous for his poem, Goodbye Christ, plus the later infamous Hollywood Ten, headed by Dalton Trumbo, John Howard Lawson, Lester Cole, Edward Dimitrik, etc., etc., all of them were later convicted at the congressional hearing in Washington. At the same time, I named the following viciously treasonous red fronts many of them had organized and directed, such as American-Soviet Friendship, Hollywood Anti-Nazi League, Institute for Democratic Action, Independent Citizens Committee of Arts, Sciences, and Professions, American Committee for Protection of Foreign Born, Film Audiences for Democracy, Young People's Records, Hollywood League for Democratic Action, Motion Picture Artists Committee, etc., etc. At least 70 of the Reds I named in my speech were in the audience. I dared all of them to challenge my charges and to sue me if it ain't so. None of them challenged me. Not one of them ever sued me. I won't go into the details of how the press critics reviled the play. That was fully expected. They had openly stated in advance that they would. No matter how well written or directed or acted the play would be. But my speech hit the front pages all over the country. It was aired by radio commentators, all, of course, blasting me as a liar and anti-Semite. But it also promptly activated Congressman Parnell Thomas, then chairman of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. He flew to Hollywood and hauled in for questioning some of the red stars I had named in my speech. He also talked with some of the more courageous pro-American stars. Then he held a preliminary hearing in Los Angeles. What he heard gave him sufficient grounds to call for a thorough investigation by the entire Congressional Committee in public hearings in Washington. Hollywood exploded. The Reds defied Thomas. They vilified him and threatened that if he went through with the hearings, they would destroy him politically. And as we know, they did. But Parnell Thomas was a man of great courage and loyal to his country. He went right ahead with his plans for the hearings. The Hollywood Reds had been fiendishly clever through all the years in which they had gradually enslaved the entire industry but apparently their success had gone to their heads. They decided to declare an open fight on Thomas and on the entire Congressional Committee. First of all, they organized their infamous Committee for the First Amendment, the most vicious of all the Red Fronts in Hollywood. This was done at a meeting at the home of Louis Milestone, one of the top Red Commissars in Hollywood. William Z. Forster, then head of the Communist Party in the United States, and spokesman for Uncle Joe Stalin, came on from New York to personally mastermind the proceedings. Next, this new committee launched a full-page advertising campaign in all theatrical trade papers and fan magazines in which the Congressional Committee was violently attacked and flayed for, quote, interfering with the freedom of the individual, unquote and the press all over the country supported their claims with front-page editorials. Following that, they launched a two-hour radio broadcast, 
All of the Hollywood Red Stars participated in it, plus many non-Reds who were actually blackmailed into contributing their presence and talents. It was a nationwide broadcast, a perfervid appeal to all their millions of brainwashed fans and worshippers. They, the Red Stars, screamed their righteous indignation and branded the impending hearings in Washington not as an investigation of treasonous red activities in the film industry, but as an invasion of the privacy of all of the American people and a threat to the freedoms guaranteed by our Constitution. And amazingly, their fans believed them. So brainwashed were they by their idolatry and by the press and radio. Many, many thousands of otherwise loyal Americans wrote blistering wires and letters to the Congressional Committee and to their own representatives and senators, also to their newspapers and weekly news magazines, and all those letters were published. In addition, the liberal press editors and columnists joined in the outcry against the congressional monsters. Ditto radio commentators. But Parnell Thomas ignored the entire commotion and calmly continued to serve subpoenas to the Red Star's writers, directors, and producers who denied they were Reds, insisted that they were just liberals. And then the Hollywood hierarchy made their biggest mistake. They decided to put on a show at the hearings, a show that would, in the lingo of tough guy Humphrey Bogart, make a monkey of Thomas and his whole congressional committee. At that, that didn't sound like a far-fetched threat. After all, they had all the great actors in Hollywood to choose from for a burlesque of that sort. Who would better know how to ridicule and needle those congressmen? Who would better know how to jibe and jeer and inflame an audience, all of the American people, against those congressional monsters? Thus, on the eve of the hearings, a plane load of Hollywood's most glamorous red stars, headed by Danny Kaye, Gregory Peck, Lauren Bacall, all field marshaled by bold bad man Bogart, landed at the Washington airport heralded in advance by Washington's Post and Star, themselves as liberal as any of the Hollywood Reds, a great crowd of their movie fans were on hand to greet and welcome their idols. Simultaneously, the entire nation's press and radio were making a great to-do about that great crusade by the people's Red Darlings. Danny Kaye, fancying himself as quite a Mark Anthony, delivered an oration as did Bogart and the others, and then all those brave and treasonous would-be emancipators from congressional tyranny marched through densely crowded streets and cheering mobs to their battlefront in the balcony of the hearing room in the old house office building. But lo and behold, at the hearing everything went awry. Without a script and director to guide them, the Hollywood clack jibed and jeered at the wrong times and cheered the wrong individuals. The brainwashed fans who had come there to cheer their idols, disillusioned and disgusted, began to hiss and boo. From that point, everything went from bad to worse. The friendly witnesses, stars and writers, whom the Red Hierarchy had cast in roles of villainy, told the true story of the Red Conspiracy in Hollywood and emerged as heroes. The Reds, particularly the infamous Hollywood Ten, whom the same Hollywood hierarchy had projected as heroes in the piece, came out covered with infamy and penitentiary sentences. Then to complete the debacle, the press and radio, who with great eagerness had come there to ridicule the committee, were forced to reverse themselves and publish far and wide the guilt of the Red Stars. Pardon me, I mean liberals. Thus, practically in a matter of minutes, the Reds wrecked a perfect treason machine they had been secretly building in Hollywood for 25 years. So secretly had they been building it, the American people not only had no suspicion of it, but had actually been making it possible by their patronage at the box offices, thus financing films that were poisoning the minds of our youth and brainwashing all the people of the whole world. But we, the people, are slow to learn. That first congressional investigation left me with three inescapable conclusions. Number one, 
It provided concrete evidence that the short memory of our people is the greatest menace to the very life of our country. Number two, that the CFR controlled communications media are directly responsible for that short memory, as I will later show. Number three, that the Reds never quit. In that year, 1947, everybody old enough to read was made fully aware of the vile treason committed by the Reds in Hollywood. Each and every day of those hearings, the press throughout our nation front-paged every detail of that horrifying story. They didn't dare to ignore it or play it down because more than 300 stars, writers, directors, and producers were officially declared guilty. It not only shocked the people, it enraged them. But practically the very day after those hearings ceased, both the press and the radio went into deep silence. And tragically, the people proceeded to forget all about it. In anticipation that that would happen, during the weeks preceding the hearings in Washington, I appeared before various women's clubs and various patriotic groups, and in my speeches I predicted that the hearings would create a nationwide sensation. I predicted that the press would not dare to ignore the facts that would be brought out at those hearings. But I also warned that both the press and the radio would go into complete silence after the hearings would close, and I warned my audiences against the tragic propensity of the people to forget. I also warned that the Reds never quit. One very wonderful result came out of my speeches and warnings. Under the leadership of Mrs. J. Henry Orme of the Ebell Women's Club, a very wonderful patriotic American woman, 100 presidents of women's clubs in Southern California, particularly in the Hollywood area, met and organized what they called Citizens United for American Principles. Those women's clubs presidents agreed to serve as a committee of 100 directors of the organization and they appointed Rupert Hughes, a famous writer and uncle of Howard Hughes, to serve as their advisory chairman. Their objective was as simple as it could have been highly effective. That objective was to urge all loyal Americans to boycott all movie theaters that would continue to show red propaganda films and films employing the 300 reds named and officially identified by the Congressional Committee. That would destroy the box offices of those theaters and thus destroy the revenues of all the red conspiracy's producers. True, that might destroy the entire film industry, but it would also break the back of the entire Red Conspiracy. To save themselves, it would force the producers to blacklist the named Reds out of all films. It would force them to abandon the making of Red propaganda films. As I stated, that objective could have been the cure for the Red Conspiracy in Hollywood, but I promptly pointed out to that committee that their procedure was all wrong, that they were making their organization vulnerable to destruction by the enemy. By the enemy, I meant Motion Picture Producers Association and their chief ally, the notorious Anti-Defamation League. They asked me to explain how and why they would be so vulnerable. My explanation was very simple. The enemy would simply launch a campaign to terrorize the supermarkets and all other merchants to boycott the products of the husbands of that committee of 100 women. All those women scoffed. They said the enemy just would not dare to attempt such a boycott. Several days later, it happened. One of the committee, whose husband was the head of one of the largest dairy companies in Southern California, frantically withdrew her club from the organization because her husband's business was threatened by the very boycott scheme I had warned against. During the following two weeks, approximately 60 additional panicked members of the committee withdrew for the very same reason. In addition, Rupert Hughes, then in the late 70s, stated that the job of advisory chairman was too strenuous for a man of his age, and he resigned. Thereupon, Mrs. Orme and the remaining members of the committee called me into a meeting. 
and asked me to tell them how they could carry on. They were determined not to surrender their objective. My advice was simple. Their objective was to educate all of the American people about the Red Menace in Hollywood and unite them into destroying that menace. Therefore, the name of their organization must distinctly emphasize that objective, and I suggested a new name, the Cinema Educational Guild, also to make the organization, CEG, invulnerable to the attacks of the enemy, the committee of the presidents of the women's clubs must be disbanded, and the names of the new directors of CEG and of the members of the guild must never be revealed. Thus there would be no targets for the enemy except myself if I became the head of CEG, and I would be invulnerable. The enemy could do no more to me than they had already done. Mrs. Orme and the others agreed, and that was when and how the Cinema Educational Guild came into existence. And at this time, let me stress that ever since then, I have continuously been stressing that the Reds never surrender, that they never let go of anything they have in their grip, that when unmasked and cornered, they retreat, they smile, they offer to coexist, and I've continuously warned that the moment the victim lets down his guard, they, the Reds, pile in more ruthlessly than ever. The Moscow Reds confirmed all that in Hungary in 1956. Remember? In short, the Reds can't be licked. They must be destroyed. But there's only one way to do it, through their pocketbooks. There must be a nationwide boycott of all theaters that show films with red stars or films with red propaganda. Kill such films at the box offices and you will destroy the ammunition, money of the producers. The same is true of radio and TV in a different yet similar way. The moguls of radio and TV do not have to depend upon box offices for their revenue. They depend upon the sponsors who pay for the time to show their TV shows and commercials that advertise their products. A nationwide boycott of the products of such sponsors will quickly cure that disease. It will keep those red stars and red propaganda shows out of your living rooms, shows that poison the minds of your easily influenced children. Time after time after time, we drove the reds out of Hollywood, the people assumed that they had achieved a great and final victory, that the whole war had been won, and then they'd proceed to forget, and the Reds would come slithering back. There is absolutely no doubt that a fully alerted people can kill this Red conspiracy in Hollywood. Let's go back to that first hearing in Washington. The reactions of the suddenly aroused American people to the revelations at that hearing swept panic through all of Hollywood. Mayor, Warner, and all the other panic-stricken moguls piously vowed that they would immediately begin a drive to house-clean all Reds and Red traitors out of Hollywood. Of course, they lied. Despite their fright, those moguls had no thought of reforming. They merely determined not to be caught again. Actually, however, they couldn't have reformed even if they had truly wanted to which they didn't, because the real controls of Hollywood are firmly in the hands of such internationalist bankers as Lehman Brothers, Kuhn Loeb, Goldman Sachs, the Warburgs, etc., who financed practically all the big Hollywood lots, all of whom are directors and the top brass of the Council on Foreign Relations, the hierarchy of the great conspiracy. Practically every Hollywood lot Every national TV network, every national radio network was financed and is controlled by those internationalist bankers, and therefore all of them are controlled by the CFR. That entire story of the enslavement of our entire mass communications media and all their betrayals of the American people is fully revealed in our Illuminati CFR recording. The brazen sham of all those promises and pious vows of the moguls at that first Washington hearing was clearly revealed after the infamous Hollywood Ten were released from prison. 
The moguls had faithfully promised that none of those ten would ever again be employed by Hollywood. But immediately after their release, all of them were restored to their old jobs under fictitious names and had doubled their previous salaries. Naturally, we, CEG, turned all that evidence over to the FBI and the Congressional Committee. But even more important, after about a year of disappearance from Hollywood, many of the Congressional exposed stars, such as Frederick March, Gene Kelly, Humphrey Bogart, John Garfield, Edward G. Robinson, etc., were back on the lots and getting the best roles in Hollywood. We waited for action from the Congressional Committee, but no action came. So we, CEG, decided to do a job of reminding the people in our own way. I wrote and CEG published a book which I called Red Treason in Hollywood, in which I revealed the full story of the Red Conspiracy in the film industry, and I named all the top Red Stars, writers, directors, and producers. That was the first time that such a complete and direct charge had ever been published and so many of Hollywood's royalty named as traitors. The book created a sensation. It even caught the press off guard. Editorial writers and syndicated columnists, among them, believe it or not, Ed Sullivan, who acclaimed the book as a Bible for those who want the truth about conditions in Hollywood. Sullivan stressed that the author's background in the theater in Hollywood gave the book an authenticity that no outside writer could have provided. But our press holiday didn't last very long. The notorious Anti-Defamation League, who had previously warned me of dire consequences if I persisted in my exposition of the Red Conspiracy, came roaring into the battle. They issued an order, and all the Red, Pinko, and Liberal publications began a hysterical screaming of anti-Semitic, basing their screams on the fact that there was a heavy percentage of Jews among the red traitors I had named in the book. The ADL did not deny that those individuals were reds and traitors. That apparently did not matter. My crime was the naming of them, and within a matter of days, both the press and radio were completely closed to us even for paid advertising. All bookstores and even libraries were terrorized into blacklisting the book. In addition, they terrorized the printer we had employed into refusing our reprint orders and into destroying all plates of the book. That has happened with all our books, and the moguls blithely continued to employ all the reds and brazenly continued to issue red propaganda films. Right then and there, I learned the answer for the red disease in the film industry. The blackouts by the press and radio kept the people completely in the dark about what was going on in Hollywood. True, that congressional hearing of 1947 had revealed it, but that was more than a year previously, and the tragic short memory of the people had made them forget all about it. So right then and there, we, CEG, adopted a new technique to break through that blackout. We organized picketing committees to picket the theaters showing the Red Stars and Red Propaganda films. To provide TNT ammunition for the pickets, we issued a special six-page tract which contained the salient features of Red Treason in Hollywood and a listing of the Reds. We made them available at the rate of $2 for 100 tracts, and they are still available. Within a few months, more than 2 million copies of that tract were in circulation throughout the nation. In Newark, New Jersey, a war veterans post had its members picketing the premiere of a new Charlie Chaplin film and killed it for the entire country. In Los Angeles, we picketed to death the death of a salesman and other red films. In Chicago and other cities, the American Legion and veterans of foreign wars did similar jobs. The press just could not or did not dare to ignore the picketings. And once again, our story became a front page sensation. Theaters all over the country canceled their bookings of all the picketed films. And the panic was really on. 
the Frederick Marches, Eddie Cantors, John Garfields, Orson Welles, and many of the Red Stars named in our tract became poison at the box offices. Receipts zoomed down in all theaters showing such stars. Theater owners all over the country began to scream, and that brought on another congressional investigation. That did it. <laughs>